you uh, U.S. military, it's finally withdrawn from Afghanistan after 20 years. Are you happy about that? Happy in one way, because um, uh, there was never going to be any military solution in Afghanistan. Anxious that they are leaving. Without a political settlement, there's a possibility of civil war. What would a political settlement look like? A political settlement in Afghanistan uh, would mean a sort of a coalition government, a government from uh, the Taliban side and, 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 and the other side. There is no other solution. Do you think uh, the Americans made a mistake by settling in and out of ISIS? Difficult, you know. They, were, they got themselves, they have got themselves in such a big mess. They had to give some sort of time frame. But that the moment they gave a time frame, Taliban would have considered that a victory. How do you feel about the prospect of the Taliban effectively controlling Afghanistan? Like, are, you, are you happy to welcome them into the community of nations? As far as Pakistan is concerned, whoever represents the people of Afghanistan, we will deal with them. But what if they're not democratically elected? That's not through elections, they've done it through brute force. And does it not concern you on some level that, that this group of people is, is accumulating power right next door to you? Look, I'm not a spokesman for Taliban. For me to say, you know, what they are doing or what they shouldn't be doing is, is pointless right now. In case Afghanistan, uh, Taliban go for a war of victory, there is going to be incredible amount of bloodshed. And let me tell you, the country that is going to suffer the most after Afghanistan is going to be Pakistan. Will you allow the American government to have CIA here in Afghanistan uh, to conduct cross-border counter-terrorism missions against Al-Qaeda, ISIS, or the Taliban? Absolutely not. There's no way we're going to allow Seriously? any bases, uh, any sort of action from Pakistani territory uh, into Afghanistan. Absolutely not. Pakistan has suffered 70,000 casualties, more than any other country, by joining the American war. We will be partners in peace, not in conflict. Have you spoken to Joe Biden since he took office? No, I haven't. Is there a reason for No, uh, well, I mean, uh, you know, when, whenever he has time, he can speak to me. But at the moment, clearly, he has other priorities. What would you say if you had the I would, you see, the U.S. has a big responsibility as, uh, you know, the most powerful nation in the world. They have this huge responsibility in the subcontinent. This is a, a, almost 1.4 billion people and living in the subcontinent. We are held hostage. One dispute in Kashmir, a disputed territory, uh, according to the United Nations Security Council resolutions, there should have been a plebiscite for the people of Kashmir to decide about their own future. That has never taken place. It's frustrating. Over 100,000 Kashmiris have died in this freedom struggle. And uh, it can easy, if the Americans have the resolve, the will, this can be sorted out. Let's talk about a relationship that many people are concerned about. How are your current relations with India and Prime Minister Narendra Modi? Uh, I, you know, when I became the Prime Minister, I reached out to him immediately. I said, you know, you've come one step towards us, we've come two towards you, uh, you know, television, I said this. And I said that, you know, the, my main concern, my main reason for coming into politics was to uh, eradicate poverty in Pakistan, make it a welfare state. This is why I came, and secondly, rule of law. These were my two slogans, uh, make Pakistan a welfare state, rule of law in Pakistan. And you can only, the best way to eradicate poverty, not just in Pakistan, in India as well, is to trade with each other. India is a huge market. Pakistan is a market of 220 million people. But it's, it's a door to Central Asia uh, and to the energy corridor, which India is energy short. So we would mutually benefit each other. Uh, so I, um, I reached out. 
But I realized that there's, you know, I was up against an ideology. You see, Narendra Modi is RSS. RSS what is, is, is the party which was formed in the 20s, which idolized the, uh, the Nazis. They, 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 you can even Google it, the founding fathers looked up to Hitler and, uh, and the Nazis and racial purity and you know, all that sort of uh, that ideology. And so we came up, up, I mean my government came up against this brick wall. We couldn't uh, go through because then we couldn't understand in the beginning. And then it gradually came out when the, you know, the, the steps they took in Kashmir, unilaterally they took away Kashmir statehood in uh, 2019, uh, August uh, 5th, 2019. And so since then, uh, we have no, there's a freeze on our relationship. We cannot start talks until they go back, they take back the steps they took on, on uh, uh, 5th August 2019, when they, you know, unilaterally took away the statehood of Kashmir. I want to ask you about something you were talk you talked about on live television. It was a very serious and painful issue. You were asked about the epidemic of sexual violence and rape in Pakistan, and you acknowledged the seriousness of the problem. And you talked about Pakistan's strict laws. You were also quoted as saying that the practice of women wearing veils, quote, is to stop temptation. Not every man has willpower, you said. If you keep increase on increasing vulgarity, it will have consequences. This created, as you know, a bit of an uproar, and you were accused of rape, victim blaming. How do you respond to that? It is such nonsense. What was I saying? I said, I said that the fastest the crime, when I first came into power, I asked the heads of police, that what is the, you know, the, the crime for this? The crime that was rising the past was sex crime. Sex crime was not just rape, it was child abuse. Child abuse was really what really shocked me. And the disturbing thing was that barely 1% got reported. The families of the victims, whether they were girls or whether they were children who were being abused, were so embarrassed that they would not report it. So therefore, what I was saying was that uh, law enforcement can then bas basically only deal with less than 1%. The rest, the society has to deal with. And the society through awareness, you know, and, and, and I never said veils, this was never said. I said the, the, the concept of parda. Concept of parda is avoid temptation in the society. So, and I went further. We don't have discourse here, we don't have nightclubs. You don't have any, like in Western societies, you don't have any places where boy meets girl. So it, it is a completely different uh, society way of life here. So if you, if you raise temptation in the society to the point, and all these young guys have nowhere to go, it has consequences in the society which were reflected in the crime chart. So one, you fight uh, crime, uh, sex crime through law enforcement, but because the majority, and I majority mean ninety nine percent of sex crimes are not reported, and this is according to the police officers. So therefore, the society, public schools, awareness, teachers, media, everyone must join in because that's how we will sort of raise awareness against sex crimes. So, so, so the concept of I used clearly, I know exactly what I said. I said the concept of Parda. Parda is not just to, it's, it's to reduce temptation in the society. So what, I want, I want, this is what I'm trying to get, is the clarity, and I'm glad that you can explain this. What, what are the forms of temptation uh, that need to be curtailed to stop the rise of well, rape? For, for one, uh, and remember, Rape is less okay, sexual violence. What are the forms of so, so so child abuse is less it is much more than rape. Okay. So you know these were the shocking things. So for instance, one thing we also discovered because then we did a bit of research on mobile phones. Right. Children have mobile phones. Material available on mobile phones. Children have never been. Uh, uh, and they've never seen such material in human history. It's never happened. 
Children have never had this exposure before. So, so when I said the whole society has to fight, starting from, you know, how do we deal with this? And by the way, we are now uh, trying to find out how to con um, control content on social media. So that's one, but it's, at the moment it's free for all. And then, you know, uh, television plays, uh, they should be educating people, you know, about, um, about um, the, the sort of things that children are exposed to. And so, so, when you mean the society, you mean all the various ways, starting from schools, everywhere, the society must fight sex crimes. You also mentioned in that interview Bollywood and Hollywood. Do you believe that Bollywood and Hollywood films have contributed to this rise in sexual violence? Absolutely. The, 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 when I, you know, I can only compare when I went to England uh, as an 18 year old. Uh, you know, there were adults only films. The content on films was completely different. And then we saw it changing throughout. You know, what was taboo maybe in early 70s mm -hmm. was acceptable in late 70s. So, so when, when you, uh, when on films the content gets X-rated and these become acceptable, clearly it has a, 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 a effect on the society. X-rated is sort of underground. I mean, you don't really believe the Hollywood films or mainstream Hollywood or Bollywood films are causing a rise in sex. Yes. No. You see, what kind of films? Let, let me tell you, Hollywood, the way it works in the subcontinent, from Hollywood it goes to Bollywood, which is in India, okay. which has completely changed again. What was the Indian film industry in the 70s and the 80s, gradually in the 90s and what it is now, is completely changed. So the content is completely different. And it has an impact on the society. If anyone is telling me that this does not have, have an impact, impact you can just read, you can just see the divorce rates, you can see the sex crime. It has an effect both in India and Pakistan. So, so we then so we then take the content from India, yeah. out of the films take it. And so basically I what I was saying was that there must be an alternative. You must show an alternative, our own way of life. There is another way of life. Because modernity is not just permissiveness. It's not modernity. You know, if we are thinking that, you know, if you just have more and more permissive content on television or on films, this is modern. It's not modern. Again, I, I watch a lot of Hollywood films. I, I don't see anything that would inspire me to commit acts of... But, but Jonathan, you live in a Western society. I know. You know, so you've grown up there. I'm talking about the impact it has on, on our society. Um, we have seen the change here. You know, there's a massive change taking place. And the, every society must analyze itself. They must work out what are, what are the impact it is having on different segments, and then take steps. Do you think that what women wear has any effect? That, that that's part of this temptation? Well, you know, if, if, a, if a woman is uh, uh, wearing very few clothes, it will have an impact on the men, unless they're robots. I mean, it's common sense. Uh, yes, but is it really going to provoke acts of sexual violence? Uh, it depends which society you live in. If in a society people haven't seen that sort of thing, it will have an impact on them. If you grow up in a society like it, maybe it won't on you. So, I'm not talking... Uh, Jonathan, you must understand. This is this problem we face, this, this cultural imperialism, whatever is in our culture must be acceptable to everyone else. It's not. It, every culture is different. And, and therefore, when you introduce things in a culture, it has different impacts then. But forgive me, like, when you were a cricket star, you, you, were, you were seen in, as a playboy, you know, there were photos of you with your shirts off in your bedroom. Like, it's, it's, Jonathan, it's a bit rich. It's Jonathan, like a rich this, you know, this is not about me. It's about my society. Like, don't you feel like it's a bit rich for you to say this? Jonathan, it's... listen, it's about my society. My priority is how my society behaves, what, what reactions are caused in my society. So when I see sex crime going through the roof, it's not just me. We bring people sit down and we discuss it from different uh, 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 sectors of the society, we sit down, we discuss how we're going to tackle this. We have a problem. 
Now, are you going to tell me that I'm going to sit back and say, okay, we have this rising sex crime, but because of the Australia, it doesn't have any impact, so we should do nothing about it. It is having an impact in my society. We have to do something about it. It doesn't mean what Imran Khan did 40 years or 50 years ago, so it's a it's hypocrisy. This is absolute lunacy what you're talking about. It's absolute nonsense. We have a responsibility. I, as a prime minister, have a responsibility. When a sex crime, crime takes place, when a child is abused, he's traumatized for life. We have to do something about it. One thing that um, is striking to me coming here is in America we have about 100 million more people than you, not so much more. 600,000 Americans have died of COVID. Your country, as I understand, something like 20,000, 25,000. You've done objectively vastly better than the United States with COVID. Why? Well, first, uh, you know, as someone believes in God, it's, you know, we are very thankful because there's so much you can do and then there's something which is the twilight zone which is beyond you. So you can only try your best. So what happened? When, the, when we saw these uh, people ending up in hospitals, COVID raging through Europe, Spain and Italy were the first two countries where you saw hospitals full. Uh, and there was a big temptation in Pakistan by all uh, other uh, politicians, leaders, opposition, that we should clamp down, we should uh, total, lockdown. total lockdown like it was happening actually. Right. And so, you know, even though I kept asking what will happen to our poor people who are daily waiters, 70%, 75% of our workers are in the informal economy. Daily waiters, weekly waiters, so, but, uh, and, and Watching what was happening in Europe, there was a clamp down. We had smart lockdowns. We then had what's what's a smart lockdown? So so we had this control and command center where we accumulated daily all data coming from Pakistan. So we got the Pakistan army involved, all the provinces involved. We would get daily data. We had our doctors um, sitting there, infectious uh, disease specialists, and they were monitoring the whole thing. And what we did was we would had these hot spots where there was and we would try and lock them down. But we did not lock down everyone. And that's why we saved our economy from, we would have been destroyed, we already were suffering. Pakistan already had a dire economic situation. Had we locked down, our economy would have just gone belly up. So we saved the economy and at the same time, because you cannot lock up hungry people, our lockdowns were more effective. India, on the other hand, their prime minister in give a four-hour notice and just imposed a curfew on it. So there were these people, uh, millions of people walking on the roads, clusters, and, and he did not think what would happen to the poor people. You can't, people, eight, six, seven people living in one room, how do you lock them down? And then if you do not provide them food, how long can you keep them inside? So therefore, we, our balanced approach actually saved us. So Pakistan actually managed to control it too. Secondly, we saved our economy and we came out of it better than other countries. Having said that, we still haven't come out of it completely because until we vaccinate everyone. What's your dream for Pakistan? I repeat, it's the dream is to raise people out, out of poverty. That's my biggest, uh, uh, which is why I think what China has to, done is brilliant and we've studied all the steps they took for people to get out of poverty. So that's number one, you know, there's nothing worse than poverty in society. Everything else is secondary. And then is rule of law, and rule of law is very important because, in my opinion, the countries remain poor because they don't have rule of law. Uh, there's a uh, very interesting report by uh, the Secretary General, the UN Secretary General, Fact I Panel, and this investigated what is happening the, the flight of capital from the developing world every year. From these poor countries, one trillion dollars moved towards Western societies and uh, uh, towards Western capitals and offshore uh, accounts. So this is the, and it happens because there's no rule of law, because the powerful can use the system and siphon off this money. And your predecessor did that? Uh, my both, the two families that, that uh, 
we have basically ruled Pakistan for 30 years. I mean, they have just taken billions of dollars out of Pakistan. So when when this huge amount of money leaves the country, it, you can't. That money could be spent on human development, reducing poverty, on um, uh, infrastructure, all the ways that you can create wealth. So not only do you get impoverished because that money is taken away, but then it is they buy dollars to take it out. So the, it impacts your currency, and when it impacts your currency, when the uh, when your um, currency devalues, it raises poverty because it uh, causes inflation. So two things: one is uh, you know steps taken to uh, reduce poverty, make Pakistan a welfare state, and secondly to bring the powerful under the rule of law. I want to ask you about one more subject, which is climate change. You Pakistan suffers from climate change in a way that I think people in America couldn't begin to understand. Like, you are in the cauldron, almost ground zero of climate change. Help an American watching this, there's going to be a lot of Americans watching this, help them understand what, what the stakes are for this issue and, and what needs to change in your life. Um, well, for Pakistan, you see, for, for the Americans to understand why it is uh, critical for us that uh, the world uh, moves to fight climate change. 80% of all the water in our rivers come from our glaciers, which are in the mountains, Himalayas, Karakoram, the mountain ranges. And if the, the temperature keeps rising at the rate it is, there's this, our glaciers are melting. I was talking to the president of Tajikistan, which is on the other side of the mountains. Uh, they said that 1,000 glaciers have melted in their mountains, which bring water to their rivers. So if, uh, if these glaciers are, are melting at a fast rate and this temperature keeps rising, then we are facing hundreds and millions of people are going to face starvation. So not just Pakistan. I mean, India will face the same thing because the Ganges plain is, all, again, hundred, hundreds of millions of people, and they depend on the water from the Himalayas too. So this is the big problem. But we, Pakistan's contribution to climate, uh, global warming is minuscule. We, our emissions are less than 1%. 1 billion uh, from uh, 2013 to 18. Now we planted already another billion, and now we're going through 9 billion more. So, the idea is that we should do our best to fight climate change.